Abbott, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book-by-book, chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God and thank you for inviting us in. To study our Father's Word, that letter that he has written to you, he's written it to me, a letter that will help us have a better quality life, a life that's meaningful, a life that you don't drift from day to day, from paycheck to paycheck, but a life that is fulfilling, that is honest, as well as we can be as human beings, that is to say, in his righteousness, though we fall short, that we have his strength that picks us up, gets us back on that road of peace, and helps us be better servants of his. We just thank him for his word, the letter, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We continue in this 96th Psalm. And what a beautiful psalm. As you will remember in closing, we came upon this acrostic in the 11th verse. An acrostic, I'm I'm going to re-explain this as I may for emphasis, for it's extremely important. In the Hebrew manuscripts, there are four words in this verse 11 in the Hebrew that have rubic characters. That's uh, um, majestic letters, if you would, that set aside these words, a hidden acrostic, giving the consonants in the sacred name of God, whereby man cannot change them. You've heard Yahweh spelled uh, in many ways. Let's stick to the consonants only. Y-H-W-H. Well, that's incorrect. Absolutely incorrect. For there are five, six acrostics in the word of God spelling the sacred name. It is V in every case. And to place a W in the word that is uh, it, that has the rubric for the V would make the the word absolutely incorrect, misspelled, inaccurate. God doesn't leave us wanting for knowledge or wisdom if we're willing to search. That verse: Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. That's the acrostic, for it is um, here. That's why. Hashemayim, that's H. Vit, and I catch that. Vit. Vitegel, that's your V. And the earth, ha, is the H. Y-H-B-H. That sacred name, Yahweh, our Heavenly Father. Lock in to say that he guarantees that verse, which is to say, let the heavens rejoice. You can rejoice in him. You don't have to be sad. And let the earth be glad. That means those that are in heaven and those that are on earth as well rejoice if they know that acrostic, if they know their father, the true father, let the sea roar in the fullness uh, thereof. Verse 12 continuing. Let the field be joyful. Hey, is he saying let this old earth be sad and down and outcast? If you know him, you can experience this emotion that he's willing to share with you. And all that is therein, then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice. Do you know that the very nature itself moans? The creation itself moans for the return of our Father. What is, look what man has done to it. You know, many of you that are my age or even older, you can remember back when nature was nature, it was not polluted. You didn't see the the disease the um, the uh, of the woods you didn't see all that has happened from acid rain etc cetera, etc cetera. verse 13 before the lord for he cometh for he cometh to judge the earth he's coming to do what judge the earth he shall judge the world with righteousness. That's the earth and the world. The world is the cosmos, the earth age, the habitable world part of it. 
with righteousness and the people with his truth. In other words, he is a fair judge. Those of you that serve him, though you fall short, you sin, hey, we all do at one time or the other, go upon repentance, that refreshing of your um, kinship with our Father. He's going to give you a reward. And do you know something? You don't have to wait till then to collect that reward. You can collect it now in his blessings. He blesses those that strive. He's going to keep you in line. When you play, you pay. I can't think of a simpler way of putting it. A colloquial term, so be it. You play, you pay. You break away from his laws, his statutes. You're going to suffer. You're going to pay for it. James was, many people misunderstand the work of James. But James says, the law of liberty. In other words, as best as you can, obey the law and you have the liberty of peace. For that law brings you that liberty and that peace. In other words, when you obey the law as best you can, and you're not going to obey it 100%, don't ever let anyone uh, deceive you into thinking if you accept Christ or if you are baptized or if you do this or if you do that, you'll never sin again. Because I tell you quite the contrary. They don't know what they're talking about, number one, but the contrary is that as long as you're in the flesh, you're going to continue to sin. For flesh itself uh, is sin in as much as its, its wants and its desires upon your very soul. I mean, it gnaws at you 24 hours a day. You don't believe that? How many of you have ever woken up? I hope not too often, but early in the morning, just starving to death. Who do you think woke you up? Your old tummy did. Said, wake up and feed me. It's the flesh disturbing your soul in its rest to be serviced. So you see... As long as we're in the flesh, we have, a, we have a witness against us that cries out and wants attention. This is why it is one of the biggest sins in the world to be caught up in self. You want to be very careful of that, my friend. God can't use people that have self-pride or think that God needs them specifically, that they are God's gift to this earth. He's only sent us one gift, and that was... Jesus Christ, who was perfect. You might say, well, what are you talking about? Why? That was Satan's sin, was pride of self. Anytime you think God needs you that much, friend, he'll cut you off. Your blessings will cease. Everything's going to go sour for you. Everything that you try to do or try to accomplish is going to fall flat on itself because all you're thinking about is self. Satan's own little trick, his method of operation to deceive people and pull them away from the living God, the true God. He sure has a way of talking to people. And unfortunately, if you ever fall into that lot, I feel sorry for you and I pray for you because you probably will not be standing among the saints until the end of the millennium. That's Satan's pride. Okay. So he's fair, very fair. If you're serving him today, the, your cup will be running over. He'll be blessing you. Oh, we all have problems, and yes, sometimes he tests us. This 97th Psalm is the new song. It's an answer to some of the, to the 96th, even if you would, or the completion of it. Let's go into it. It's prophecy. Verse 1, the Lord reigneth. Did you get that de facto? Reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the isles be glad thereof. Now, we're going on quite a ways forward. This is after or upon, either either upon the first day of the millennium or thereafter. For Jesus, uh, our Lord, does not reign until he returns as king of kings. Our Father's in control, but the Lord will not reign upon earth as it is is clearly specified here, not the heavens, but earth, until Satan has had his little round. So we see that we've gone forward. Christ has returned, the Messiah, as we continue in this psalm. See, clouds uh, and darkness are round about him. Righteousness uh, and judgment are the habitations of his throne. 
In other words, we say he's all business. All business. In other words, there might even be the clouds and the darkness. There might even be a little bit of a storm. For he has just finished bringing forth the wrath that is long, we've long been waiting for. And many on this earth deserve. His children won't receive that wrath, but they, they will. And there's going to be some stirring with the big stick. Verse 3, a fire goeth before him. That's why the clouds. And burneth up his enemies round about. This, of course, takes you on, if you would, to the attack of that great city in Revelation chapter 20. When the full Godhead de facto is about to rest in the city of Jerusalem, for as Christ and his election reign and teach for that thousand year period, Satan is released and he goes out and gathers his bands to the four corners of the earth and comes against the city. You see, he never gives up because he's got this self thing. Then God will burn them with fire as it is written in that 20th chapter of Revelation. For his lightnings enlighteneth the world. The earth saw and trembled. Quite a storm coming. But what is your light, dear one? Is it not Christ? Then you don't have to worry about his lighting. His lighting is sufficient. To you it is that warmth of the Holy Spirit, and to them it is destruction of their ways. They will be taught, but their ways will depart. Five, the hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. He ruled this earth at this time. This has a twofold meaning. Hills and mountains always are symbolic, prophetically speaking, of large nations and small nations. You know why they're all the nations are going to melt at his return? Because there's only going to be one ruler. You understand that? We're not going to have a democracy. We're not going to have a republic. We're going to have a kingdom with one ruler and his servants. That's the winning party for this hour, my friends. And all those nations will melt into nothingness, for there will be only one nation, and that is the nation of Almighty God. Six, the heavens uh, declare his righteousness, uh, and all the people see his glory. How many? Saints? Sinners? No. All is what it states. There are no classifications. All are going to see his glory as they are taught. Every knee shall bow on the first day of that millennium. Seven, confounded be all they that serve graven images, that boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all ye gods. Ha Elohim. Whether you're a ruler of one of those nations or whether you're a, uh, a misguided angel, you worship the true God, for there is only one. That's what's being said here. And many are going to be confounded and they're going to bow to Baal. It's going to happen. And in a sense, that's what's illustrated here. See that you don't. Don't be confounded or confused. You see, that's the base root of Baal or Babylon. A Zion heard and was glad. This is Mount Zion, the very mount of the temple. And the daughters of Judah rejoiced because of thy judgments, O Lord. The daughters of Judah mean the daughter cities, if you would, of uh that Mount Zion, Jerusalem. Nine, for thou, Lord, art high above all the earth. High here is Elion, the most high God. Above all the earth, thou art exalted far above all gods. Let me tell you something, there is no other God. You be very careful in this generation. I've warned you many times, but it's well to reemphasize. Many things can become a god to you. Well, how that sounds silly. How can that be? Any time that you allow something to come between you and God, 
And it could even, um, God forbid, it could even be a close friend that is so demanding of your time that you never have time to study God's Word. They always want to take you into the world doing this or doing that or whatever. It might be something very innocent, hunting, fishing, perhaps your very favorite hobby. They drive you with. Satan does and works many things to draw his uh, servants away from learning of his service or willing that they serve him. Satan works in many ways, and his bargains are fantastic. That's the sad part, is many people take him up on his bargains. Peter did. When Jesus told Peter, he said, hey, we're going up to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified there. And Peter, oh, Lord, we'll grab us some swords. We'll get an army together. It's not going to happen. And Jesus had to say, you get behind me, devil. Peter let a devil in him for a moment because of his love for Jesus. Do you understand? I mean, we have a tape titled Satan's Bargains. If you're not sharp enough to understand the method of operation that old sleuth that Satan uses, I would advise you to uh, acquire that tape. Yes, he used the love of Peter to pull Peter away from that moment that Christ had come to this earth for, to die on that cross for you and for me. And that one man, when he allowed self and self-love and comfort for the fellowship of Jesus, that it made him forget everything he had learned as he walked with the Master. Satan accomplished it. Jesus knew it. That's why he said, devil. Don't let the devil do you that way. Stay in his word. Verse 10. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. You learn to hate that sort of thing. He preserveth. He who? The Lord. He preserveth the souls of the saints. Did it say the flesh? Now, he might let your little old flesh get pinched every once in a while. He might let your old shoe get just a little bit tight. He might let you get in a little old hot spot occasionally. But he will preserve your soul. That's eternal. Hate evil and serve him. Saints are those set aside. Are you set aside? Do you have a destiny? Have you known it for a long time that there was more in God's word than you were being taught? Then you come out of that confusion. Don't be confounded in this generation. He will preserve your soul. Don't worry about your flesh. It'll take care of itself. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. The wicked what? The wicked one, Satan, Antichrist. Verse 11. Light is sown for the righteous. And bless your heart, some of you he has chosen to sow that light through. And gladness for the upright in heart. Those that mean well, that you're well intended. You know, all of our intentions are good. Sometimes it's too bad we can't fulfill them, but we try and... That's what he counts. That's the perfection he sees in you is you're in, uh, upright in heart, your good intentions in your heart. Twelve, rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. When you think how good he is to us. Hey, you know, if we all got what we had coming, and, and literally got what we had coming, we would be miserable wretches indeed, but he has forgiven us. And not only has he forgiven us, but in his holiness, he has blessed us with peace of mind, with even, yes, material things of this world. He adds them on. Perhaps he's taken a few away at times to make a stronger person out of you, a strong person to serve him. Okay, the 98th Psalm, a beautiful psalm. It's the um, it's a summons for you to sing this song with him, with the many membered body. Can you do that? Let's sing it together. Psalms ninety eight, a psalm. Oh, sing unto the Lord a, a new song. And you can remember, you can remember that that new song is going to be sung. Remember Revelation fourteen one, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. 
In other words, all of his enemies are made his footstool. Jesus Christ reigneth upon the earth, as Psalms 97. Isn't that beautiful? Do you know something? That's going to happen real soon. I really believe that with all my heart. Are you ready for it? Do you want to be able to sing this song with joy? The summons is put forth for you to sing it. All you have to do is say, Today, today I receive his word. I receive his service. Uh, I go into his service. Two, the Lord hath made known his salvation. Many times he makes that known through you, beloved. That's what he's got you for, is to help sow those seeds. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen, better translated, nations. Beloved, when God's election are delivered up, it will be the day before this, that is to say, even in this earth age, he will have brought his saints, these that he preserveth, in verse 10, whether you're delivered up before Antichrist or not, your soul is preserved. The seeds of truth are planted. This message made known of salvation. Is it not written in Mark 13 that you are not to premeditate what you will say, but the Holy Spirit will speak through you on that day for the, for the name of Jesus, for the testimony that the gospel may go out to the whole world? Who do you think it's going to? Some super preacher in this generation? No way, friend. It's the voice of that Holy Spirit speaking through all those trials that will be televised around the world. Not a super preacher, but the Holy Spirit speaking through his elect. Verse 3. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. That means the covenant and every promise. Think about that. He's remembered it. That means it's come to pass. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. And they will have seen it, beloved. We will have seen it. We will have witnessed it on that day. The end of this earth age. For make a joyful noise unto the Lord all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Hey, this is a summons for you to understand this and to know that you can. Do you understand what our Father is doing for you here? He's letting you know what tomorrow brings. For it shall happen exactly as it's written. How is it written? You're reading it, friend. Five, sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp uh, and the voice of a song. Six, with trumpets and sound of cornet, make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. You know that 98th Psalm is a beautiful thing. Sometimes I hope we, I hope in the future I can have our choir sing that for you. Seven, let the sea roar in the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Come and see. No, it's coming to pass. Let the floods clap their hands, and let the hills be joyful together, and they shall be. <clears throat> Again, the very nature itself longs for our Father's return. Nine, before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth. Praise God. With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. In other words, he's not an unfair judge. He judges fairly. You see, he knows exactly what you have done. Did you hear me? He knows exactly what you have done. That is to say, if you have not repented. He's going to judge you for that. You're not going to be able to con him. He's not going to get away with anything. That's why it's better to receive the summons to sing the song of joy and say, Father, I've, I've, I've let you down, but I want to do better. I, I, Father, I want to be a child of yours. I want to be obedient and humbly approach him. Don't be one of these ego trip characters. Humbly approach the Father and beg forgiveness for your miserable sins for the wretch that we are in the flesh. Pull your heart out to him. 
He'll forgive you and take you to his bosom instantly, and his blessings will immediately begin to flow. He wants to judge you with rewards, not conviction. <clears throat> Excuse me. Psalms 99, a continuation of that new song. The Lord reigneth, again reminding you the age. We're in the millennium. Let the people tremble. You let them respect him. He sitteth between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. That's to say, let it be shaken. And it shall be. I don't want you to read over what it said there. What's it talking about? He sitteth between the cherubims. Do you recognize it? That's the Ark of the Covenant that you've got a bunch of people going all over the country looking for. That's it. He's going to sit on it. He's returning. He's going to sit on that Ark of the Covenant within. You find the, that that Moses wrote. You find that manna, that perfect food that is preserved there. It's all there. And he's sitting on it in the millennium. Do you know where it is now? Scholars should. You better read the last two or three verses of the Revelation chapter 11 if you don't. Because the ark is not lost. Certainly not forever. And it's going to be brought back to earth. But I'm going to tell you something. Satan won't be sitting on it. Nor will he ever have an opportunity to sit on it. He might sit inside the temple, but he will never sit on this mercy seat. It is reserved. It is occupied. And he's not man enough to dislodge he who occupies it. I don't blame God for not leaving it on earth. We don't deserve it. All our forefathers could do was lose it to the enemy in the first place. I don't blame him for taking that ark back to the heavens, as it is written. Verse 2. The Lord is great in Zion. Where is he going to be sitting? He lands on that Mount of Olives, splits her asunder, provides the way, shakes the earth, shakes things back into shape, and then goes to Mount Zion, that city, Yahushalem, and he is high above all the people, El Yah. Three, let them praise uh, thy great uh, and terrible name, for it is holy. We had that sacred name in the prior psalm, Yahweh. But don't translate it terrible. Translate it fearful. It should not be translated terrible. God does not have a terrible name. He has a mighty name, a precious name, locked in the manuscripts. Do you want power? Then let him hold you up and no one can put you down because you're in his hand. And he is the most powerful, the one who has the ability to create even this universe. He has done it. It's your father. Observe his name. Learn his name. Speak his name. Pray in his name. Tell him you love him in his name. And by his name, you will receive many gifts. For the king's strength also loveth judgment. Thou dost establish equity. Thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. His law is coming back into being. That that is right. That that is fair. I exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Do we deserve to even be at his footstool? Certainly not anywhere else. Let me even be the doorkeeper as the prior psalm says. Just let me be there, for he is holy. Six, Moses and Aaron among his priests. These were the grandsons of Levi. Um, 
and, and he's speaking, Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among them that call upon his name. That call upon what? His name. Do you know his name? They called upon the Yahweh, and he answered them. You know, he said there, don't read over it. He said, look at the, God's talking very clearly. He says, look at the example set forth by Moses and Aaron. You, you people don't think I hear you. Look at the example. He said, I heard them. Didn't I answer them back? Do you think I don't hear you? That's what God is saying to you. Look at the example and learn from it. He said, I answered them. In other words, don't accuse him of not answering you. Seven, he spake unto them in the cloudy pillar. He speaks in different ways. How sharp are you? They kept his testimonies and the ordinances uh, that he gave them. That's a good start, friend, is to keep them. Hey, thou answer of them, O Lord our God. Thou wast a God that forgave us then. He is a forgiving God. Though, they, though thou tickest vengeance of their inventions. All oh, man must invent their little thing. They must go off, they must invent, in this case, a little golden calf, not much, you know. Uh, Aaron's little goodies, but man's little shortcuts. Moses taking shortcuts to the point he didn't even get to enter the promised land. You must remember again, these particular psalms were written in the 38th year of the wilderness. So it applies very definitely to those that are about to enter the promised land of the millennium age. So it's very prevalent upon you today, this generation, that you learn your Father's Word, that you not overlook it, that you understand. You know, many are going to say, well, God never talks to me. Let me tell you something. I have gone out to meditate with Father. And do you know something? I have noted that the very animals themselves notice the presence of God, the Rurak, the wind, before most men do. If you've ever gone out at night to meditate, or a day, listen to even the crickets. The crickets are singing and are happy, but when that spirit comes, a hush falls over the area. They know it. And many men don't. Say, God never talks to me. He can pass right by. And they never know it. One more verse to complete the chapter. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. Let's not Zion. For the Lord our God is holy. That day is coming, beloved. Oh, praise God that it come soon. It will. I long for it. I long for that righteous judgment of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yahweh, the name of our Heavenly Father. Listen a moment, please. Study by tape. A donation $4 per tape to the Shepherd's Chapel. The three world ages. Are you familiar with it? You need be. You've got to take the blinders off your eyes concerning this world age, the world that was and the one that's coming. Hey, it's written in your Father's Word. Are you skilled in His Word? This will help you in that uh, study. Dreams and visions, what actually are they? How do they apply? Can you translate? Do you listen to someone that God speaks through in dreams? Can you tell the true dream from the false? This tape will help you, for it discusses what God has stated. Stones of destiny, this, his cup shall not pass, or this cup shall not pass. A study of the stones that trace our ancestries to a point in another cup that will not pass, that cup that Jesus prayed about. Do you know which cup it was? It's not the one most think. Song of Moses, a song according to Revelation 15 that all Christians must know, must know by heart, must know that song that they will be singing that overcome. For you see, within the song are the very acts that God's elect will be doing in that final generation. Acrostics of 11. This is the word done. Uh, there is no other. 
that I know of in existence. Um, it shows you how biblical numerics are used in God's Word, how He hides messages for His elect, messages that strengthen you and give you a closer walk by Him by knowing your Father said that to you. Christmas. Was Christ actually born on this day? No, you will find documented evidence from the Word of God that Christmas uh, was the conception of Jesus Christ. I think you'll enjoy this. You should have it. Don't let someone rob you. All right, bless your heart. Hey, we're back. There's your 800 number, 1-800-643-4645 in this great state of Arkansas, 787-5556. You got a question? You got a comment? Share it with us, won't you? Got a prayer, prayer request? Then pass it up to us, if you will. Okay? Uh, let's get into our prayers. All right. Amy from Virginia, 11 years old. My mother needs a job and also needs her life straightened out. Amy, the Father's going to do this for you, darling, because of your faith. You just ask, and he hears you. Cecilia from Arkansas, prayer request for her brother, Vito, who has just diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, a muscle and a nerve problem. Well, praise God, he is able. Mary Lacey, my brother. Okay, Don of uh, Warica. Okay, the town I was born in. Praise God. And uh, Doris from Pennsylvania, prayer for healing of my daughter, Don. Okay, our father is able. James, prayer request. All right, thank you for the comment on the crew. Brother from Mississippi, Brother Rush from Mississippi, a prayer request. We'll be having more tests for his stomach. Okay. Uh, Robin from Texas, prayer request. Satan's coming against me and bringing thoughts of my childhood and how mother treated me. You just hang in there. Don't let him do it. Order him out of your life. You've got the power. Make a note of Luke chapter 10, verse 18 forward. Dorothy from Montana, prayer request, pain to be removed from my head and my neck. Okay? Father, you hear the cries of the children. Father, we just ask that you reach down with your precious hand. Give it a touch of love, healing, and guiding. And Father, we ask especially for Amy that you open and change people's minds concerning her mother. Give her that direction. Touch, heal, and tease us, precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, Ralph from Indiana has a question here. If Satan knows God's plan, why would he go ahead with it instead of prolonging it forever? Well, Ralph, for a very good reason, Satan doesn't have the right. If Satan had the, the right, he'd try to stay in heaven forever, but... It lets us know in Second Thessalonians chapter two, Second uh, Thessalonians chapter two, verse seven, that only he who let us will let until he be taken out of the way, which means Satan will stay there only as long as he wants to, and when Michael is ready, he's going to boot him right out on this earth. Satan um, still uses that old self ego. He thinks he can change things. He's that proud of himself. He'll always try. He'll never give up to the day he walks into the lake of fire, thinking that he can convert this world to his strength and power, and that the people will support him, and God will have a change of heart. Because the majority of the people in this earth will worship Satan. Steve from Virginia, Revelation 17, 12, 10 kings, can these be rulers of countries today? Those 10 rulers are rulers of countries in the last generation, so yes, it very well could be. Velma from Georgia, I've heard you speak of the parable of the fig tree and Judah being back in Jerusalem, and then the final generation would be now. You said the generation would be either 40 72 or 120 years from 1948. Is this a generation of just Christians or just elect? Because I see people dying every day. So who is it that is supposed to live out that generation? Well, 
A generation is a span of time and has nothing to do with living or dying um, in, in the normal sequence. Naturally, God's elect, with the exception of the two witnesses, will live to the end of that generation. Leon from Iowa. I understand what the definition of a Jew is in biblical time. But what is the definition in our time, and why so much confusion? Well, Leon, I really don't think there's any confusion in biblical times. They were called Judeans, or of Judah. They were not called the English word Jews. But it was either Yehudan, or it was Ewudas. Only until the English language came along were they called that. I really don't, I think it's the, peop, the people themselves confuse the issue. And of course, there are many Kenites that call themselves by our brother Judah's name, giving our brother Judah a great deal of problems. But I suppose our father knew that would be also. Jacques from Mass. Most ministers teach we won't be here when Babylon of Revelation 17 is established. This Babylon that is spoken of now that will celebrate uh, the World Musical Fest in September of this year, um, uh, this, this one of Iran and Iraq, uh, what impact will that have on the world today that believes the above? It's going to be very confusing to some people because God himself said that Babylon would always be a heap, and yet here we see Babylon rising as a city that there will be a great celebration there in Iraq, in the city of Babylon, in the very palace that Nebuchadnezzar received his coronation. Esther, or this palace of Ishtar, rather, will be reopened and a festival held there this September. God's talking to some people. We wrote a newsletter on it, and I just finished uh, uh, two tapes. I didn't teach them on television, and I probably won't. I don't think the television audience is ready for it. It's called the Babylon, I don't know what it's called. It's in where the, this Babylon uh, teaching, I'll have somebody maybe will bring me, I don't want to, I hear I have confused it. Well, I mean, I don't want to. I didn't call it the two Babylon, or maybe I did. I don't know. Someone will bring the information down. Luther. I challenge anyone that go, does or doesn't write you or listen to you now to send you $2 to show how many out there are listening. Well, that's a good challenge, and I'll tell you this close to the end of the month. Well, what he's saying there is I challenge everybody that's listening to send $2 to take inventory of how many actually listen to Shepherd's Chapel. That's a challenge from, from Luther, from... Uh, Texas, I believe it is. Is that what that is? No, it's Kentucky. Thank you, Luther. Uh, we'll see what results we have on that. Kay from Montana. Uh, that doesn't go for you regular supporters. Don't, don't you send, you can take part in that uh, <laughs> survey, but uh, we have to pay the satellite bill, okay? Kay from Montana. You believe the true followers of Jesus should not believe in the rapture. How can we be deceived? What would happen to us if we were? I'm not quite sure how that question, does that mean, Kay, that you do believe in the rapture, or if you did, what would? how could you be deceived? I'm going to take it that that's what it means. If you believe that the rapture, as it is commonly taught today, will take place before Antichrist sets foot on this earth with his great revival, then when, in fact, this beautiful archangel arrives soon, very soon, in the clouds saying that he's Jesus, come to rapture people out, as it is written, you're going to think it's Jesus, and you're going to run to him, and you're going to, you're going to uh, worship him. And when you worship Antichrist, when you know who he is, that's to say Satan, you're worshiping Satan. Do you know something? A Christian shouldn't do that because they cease being a Christian instantly. They're false Christians. They are anti-Christians. 
inasmuch as they worship anti-Jesus. That's how they're deceived. That's why they're going to be pay, praying for rocks, because they're ignorant of God's word. They haven't read it. They listen rather to what the majority of people would teach, and not the word of God. What will happen to you if you should do that? You'll be taught in the millennium that God loves his children. Scott from Illinois, uh, contemporary Christian music, is this imitating the world or is it of God? Uh, Scott, I, I'm uh, not being a mu musician and uh, I have heard some contemporary music that I thought was just fine. I've heard some of it that I thought, I thought was a disgrace. I think that it's according to whether it is good, in good taste and whether or not it holds up the Lord. Not that he needs being held up, but I mean it's respectful. So uh, I don't want to lump everything together under one label there saying it's good or bad. It would almost have to be judged on its own merits. And from California. Uh, two, two weeks ago, I found you on satellite, and I don't even want to, I didn't even want to get up and do my housework because I find you so interesting. Well, thank you, Ann. I'm glad you found us, and I'm glad you enjoy his word. I was baptized when I was a baby, and I feel now that I'm an adult and know Christ. I feel I should be baptized again. Is this right? Yes, if you feel that you need to be, then you should be. And uh, uh, baptism is a very personal thing. I would consider it if I felt led in that way. Bob from Minnesota. Do we partake in the money system after the Antichrist comes? In no way, shape, or form do you partake if you have to pay allegiance to his system, to his throne, to his government, to his servants, or any form or shape. You will stay clear of Babylon. You will not receive of him anything. You should have, by that time, already prepared for yourself that you don't need anything from him. Uh, Clinton from Texas. Pastor Murray uh, does not need to apologize for the way he teaches. We love him here, and those who listen understand. Well, thank you, Clinton. I think what Clinton's talking about here last... Uh, I've, um, a good critic, so to speak, a person that certainly means well and loves um, this ministry requested that I not, not use the word stupid or ignorant so much. And I said, I really, you know, in the language, in the Greek language, the word ignorant does not mean, I suppose, the same thing that it does in the English as we use it as slang so much. But when you are ignorant of something, I really don't think I need to make up a word to take its place. I really don't. I don't think I ever will. But I did apologize if it offended, because I, I certainly don't use it meaning to offend. But if you're ignorant of something, you are. Uh, let us take rocketry, um, and, and the particles that make up an atomic bomb and triggering it. I am very ignorant of the technology used in that. I don't see any sin in that or that I should be uh, embarrassed because of it. Uh, if you're ignorant of something, you are. Okay, I, I, what I'm saying again, thank you, Clinton. I just don't mean it as an insult to anyone when I use it. William from um, Alabama. The Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. And Ecclesiastes, there is a time to kill, etc. Is this a contradiction? If so, what does this mean? There are no contradictions in God's Word. And any time it would appear to you that there are, it means you're not understanding His Word. The commandment is, Thou shalt not kill, as it is stated in the King James. But that's not what it really means. It means, Thou shalt do no murder. If, if you'll make a note of Matthew chapter 19, verse 18, Jesus translates it correctly. When he states, concerning what is written, thou shalt do no murder. You see, to kill, you're supposed to kill uh, uh, a murderer. That's God's law. But that's not premeditated murder. 
You're simply carrying out a sentence uh, requested by the law of our Father. So, again, it is written in Matthew chapter 19, verse 18, correctly translated by Jesus. You read it and then understand that Moses was told, Thou shalt do no murder. That's what old Cain did. He premeditated that killing. Uh, Caroline, or Caroline, from Pennsylvania. Revelation 14.1. Why 140,000 would be on Mount Zion with the Lamb? Question. I want to read that again. Revelation 14.1. Why 140,000 would be on Mount Zion with the Lamb? If you mean why are they there on the mountain with him, then back up from 14 to verse 7 and find that they have the seal of God in their forehead. 144,000 must be sealed in their mind. What does that mean? It means that they must know God's truth from his word. That 144,000 are not the same group as God's elect, the very elect. For, believe it or not, when Antichrist comes, they're going to bow to him. But then when God's elect stand up and the Holy Spirit speaks through them, that 144,000 will hear them and say, hey, that person, that man, that woman, that child told me that this was going to happen, that a false Jesus was coming and that the Holy Spirit would speak through them. And do you know something? They prophesied that would happen. You see, a prophecy must be declared before the fact. That's why that many people that you plant seeds with, and they say, well, that's interesting, but you seal the truth, and it's very possible that they are one of those. The time, and they must be sealed before the end can come. Praise God for that. And um, you will find that there are 12,000 from each of the tribes, as it is written in that seventh uh, Revelation chapter 7. David from North Carolina. Since the Lord created Satan, doesn't he know he can never have dominion over the kingdom? Question. How can God's other children be so dumb and believe Satan's lies and join to him and try to overthrow God? I'm having trouble finding a denomination to join and be baptized in. David, you're from North Carolina. Oh, I'll tell you, a lot of people, if you, if you can't, um, then... We have people here that can baptize you, or I, I baptize two or three hundred every year, so um, uh, you um, call if you can't find someone there if you feel the need. Satan isn't dumb. He isn't dumb at all, and if you ever think he's too dumb, he could deceive you. But you see, his problem is this pride. He really thinks he's something. Satan really believes that when Michael throws him out of heaven and he has free reign on this earth, that he'll have the whole world licking his boots, Christians and all, thinking he's come to rapture him out. And do you know something? He's right. He's smart enough that he'll accomplish it. Now, you say, how could they be? I want to make sure I'm using your word and not mine. No, it's his, but I would have expressed it the same way. How can God's other children be so dumb and believe Satan's lies, they just are. And they're going to. There's, I don't really, I'm like David, I really don't know any other way to put it than that. Because they have been taught they're going to rapture out. They will do it because they will truly, in their heart, believe it's Jesus. They're going to think that it is Jesus. So, we, uh, okay. Uh, the tape uh, on... Babylon, this one being rebuilt, is. The title of it, would you believe it, is Babylon Rebuilt. And there are two tapes in it. It has not been taught on television, and I would advise all of you get it, because Babylon is rebuilt, even though the war is going on with Iran and Iraq, and it is biblically a sign. So if, if you're not familiar with it, then you need to order those tapes. Robin from Texas. How can I deal with people that are close to me explaining to them the truth that they are not flying away in the rapture. We love you all at the chapel. Well, bless your heart, Robin. 
You can come close sometimes and they turn away. Don't worry about it and don't push them. But always be skilled in your father's word and be able to document. I, I'm sure you've probably had the rapture tapes or you've heard it taught on television. You take those biblical, um, that documentation down and you cover it with them, but don't try to force it on them, okay? Debbie from Texas. I've been watching three or four months and I've never been offended by your using the term ignorant. We were, and we are now learning a lot. Well, thank you, Debbie. God bless you. I love you for that. Um, Reverend Sam from Tennessee. Please explain about the people on the sixth day. How do they come in line for the salvation plan? Just, I mean, right on line. What that is, that's the races. That's the kings and the queens of the nations that we read of in Revelation chapter 21 that come to that great uh, wall city, Jerusalem, after the Godhead de facto is upon this earth, the Gentiles of the world. That have been, that, you know, they're very special. Israelites have only one king, and that's the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But they have their king plus that king. It's documented in Revelation 21. They're in excellent shape. It is written at the end of that sixth day by our Father. He looked upon what he had created, and it was good. All the races were created, and as far as he was concerned, they were good. Bless your heart, I'm out of time. Again, I love studying this word, and I love you all so very much. I enjoy you, and I appreciate your encouragement uh, to both the crew and myself. We're going to hang in there and keep teaching God's word. It's near the end of the month. We've got that old satellite bill. If you can help on it, if we talk to you, you help us. Once you do that, but the most important thing I want you to do is stay in his word. Just study it, grow skilled and strong in it. Let our Father know you love him. Once you do that, stay in that word every day, and it's a beautiful day. Jesus is the living word.